We're ready to begin. Warm greetings from Southern California. My name is Sherry Mueller and it's my privilege to serve as the president of the Public Diplomacy Council. And it's also my privilege to welcome each of you to this first Monday forum and say thank you. We had a few technical difficulties, but we're all here and excited to bring you this very timely program. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to this first Monday forum featuring Ambassador Ryan Crocker, Ambassador Ronald Newman, and Professor Don Bishop. As most of you realize, the, there are three co-sponsors to these first Monday forum events the Public Diplomacy Association of America, the USC Annenberg Center for Communication Leadership and Policy, and the Public Diplomacy Council. And as we're all hearing sad, tragic news about tornadoes and everything, we still want to wish you and your families meaningful holidays and moments of serenity and hope and reasons to be grateful this holiday season. I wanna say a special thank you to our tech host, uh, Carla Cabrera Cuadrado, who is assisting us and facilitating from Valencia, Spain. She's the PDC rising professional. Our backup tech host is PDC graduate fellow, the Hans Tom Tuck graduate uh, fellow, Marcy um, Falk Bedos. Uh, they remind me to ask you, please, to put your questions in the Q&A box and any technical issues in the chat box. Today's forum is sponsored by one of two affinity groups of the Public Diplomacy Council, the Whole of Government Strategic Communications Affinity Group. It is co-chaired by Peter Kovach, and Peter, I want to say a very heartfelt thanks to you for orchestrating today's program. I know in your distinguished career in the Foreign Service, you, you yourself have chaired or led three whole of government efforts. Uh, your career often has um, had the theme, the intersection of religion and diplomacy. And Peter does so much community service, including teaching meditation in prisons. Um, Peter, I'm so grateful that one of your community service activities is the Public Diplomacy Council um, and your service as a board member, as an officer and on the program committee. And with that, it is my pleasure to turn the microphone over to Peter Kovach with great thanks. Peter. Oh. Thank you, Sherry, and thank you, especially uh, Ambassadors Crocker and Newman and, and uh, Professor Bishop. Uh, this is a very timely panel. Uh, as some of you may be aware, Secretary Blinken Friday announced a 90-day review of uh, Afghanistan from the State Department's perspective, so it couldn't be a more timely discussion as we evaluate that chapter in our history. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, first of all, I'm Ambassador Crocker. Uh, Ryan Crocker is a non-resident senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Other academic appointments have included diplomat in residence at Princeton, inaugural Kissinger Fellow at Yale, the James Schlesinger Distinguished Visiting Professor at the University of Virginia, and Texas A&M, where he was Dean of the Bush School of Government. Uh, Ambassador Crocker was a career uh, foreign service officer who served six times as an American ambassador. Uh, Afghanistan, most recently, Iraq, Pakistan, Syria, Kuwait, and Lebanon. And I had the honor of working for him in Pakistan. He serves on the board of advisors of No One Left Behind, an NGO dedicated to ensuring that America keeps its promises the Afghans and Iraqis who risked their lives to support us. He received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor in 2009. Other recent awards include the West Point Association of Graduates Thayer Award in 2020 and the inaugural Bancroft Award presented by the Naval Academy in 2016. 
Also in 2016, he was named an honorary fellow of the Literary and Historical Society at University College Dublin, where he was presented the annual James Joyce Award. He is an honorary Marine. Ambassador Ron Lee Newman, I've also had the honor of uh, serving under, uh, is the president of the American Academy of Diplomacy. Uh, the American Academy of Diplomacy is an organization of former senior U.S. diplomats dedicated to improving American diplomacy. Ambassador Newman was ambassador to Algeria, uh, Bahrain, and most recently Afghanistan from 2005 to 2007, as well as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for the Middle East and a senior officer in Iraq. Earlier, he served in Senegal, the Gambia, Iran, Yemen, and where I work for him, and the United Arab Emirates. He has returned frequently to Afghanistan since his retirement in 2007. Uh, he has authored uh, a couple of relevant books, The Other War, Winning and Losing in Afghanistan, and Three Embassies, Four Wars, a personal memoir, as well as numerous articles and book chapters. He was an infantry officer in Vietnam and holds the combat infantry badge. He's on the boards of the Middle East Policy Council, the School of Leadership, Afghanistan, which is abbreviated SOLA, and the Advisory Council of the Spirit of America. Finally, our moderator, Don Bishop, Donald Bishop, is well known to this audience as a former president of the Public Diplomacy Council. During his career as a Foreign Service Public Diplomacy Officer, he spent 25 of 31 years overseas, mostly in East Asia, but with tours in Bangladesh and Nigeria. He was Minister Counselor for Public Affairs in China, and his final assignment was in the same position at the American Embassy in Kabul from 2009 to 2010 during the so-called civilian search. Professor Bishop currently occupies the Bren Chair of Strategic Communications at the Krulak Center for Innovation and Creativity at Marine Corps, Corps University. Without any further ado, thank you so much for this distinguished panel and onward over to you, Don. Uh, and is everyone hearing me? Okay. Now, whole of government and one team, one fight were rather commonplace phrases in Washington and Afghanistan. But in my view, whether from frictions, shortcomings, imbalances of people and resources, lack of agreement on how whole of government concepts should be implemented, incongruent legal authorities, turf protection, or other reasons, this ideal wasn't realized. My own take is that the efforts of many departments and agencies in the executive branch, whether in Washington or Afghanistan, often pulled in different directions. And relations between the embassy and commands in Afghanistan uh, fell somewhat short of the one team, one fight ideal, at least during my time. This applied to public diplomacy and strategic communications too. Now, in the aftermath of the evacuation from Kabul, there's been an excess of simplistic and monocausal assertions and a deficit of serious analysis. There's been finger pointing and blame shifting, some aggravated by our current domestic divisions. We all know our national effort in Afghanistan needs serious, well-rounded analysis, and it will probably reveal a large bundle of overlapping causes that contributed to the unhappy outcome earlier this year. There needs to be a serious attempt to reckon lessons learned and the effort must come sooner, not later. And perhaps our conversation today can point the way to a start. Now in an earlier conversation, Ambassador Newman offered the insight that a whole of government effort suffered from a lack of uh, formal authorities. Ambassador Newman, could you elaborate on that thought? Sure, with pleasure. Uh, and I'm sure Ambassador Crocker has plenty of experience that he can elaborate as well. Uh, but, you know, at the most basic level where you have issues like countries, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, you have separate legal definitions so that the ambassador and the head of the commanding general military effort uh, do not have a single chain of command. And first place where the military and civilian chains of command can legally come together in our government is the president of the United States. And where there is no lower authority, it means that 
you're very heavily dependent on personalities. And that can work very well, as I've seen at certain times, it can work very badly. As I've also and I would say one thing I've noticed is that if the ambassador and the president are not in a uh, Master and Commanding General are not in agreement. I've never known a situation in which departments did not support their own person. Uh, so that means you have to refer things to the president if they don't work. And people usually don't want to refer that kind of issue, personality, conflicts, to the president who's busy with a lot of other stuff. And so things tend to fester. You have a subordinate problem that while the ambassador has technical authority over all other parts of the government, executive branch of the country. Each agency is always busy sending separate instructions to its own people. So that is controllable, but it takes a very strong ambassadorial hand to deal with pieces together. Ambassador Crocker might want to comment on this. He never acted for a strong ambassadorial. Well, Ambassador Crocker, uh, in our earlier conversation, you had uh, also mentioned that whole of government cooperation is often personality driven uh, based on the rapport, the communication and collaboration between ambassadors and commanders. Uh, you added the insight uh, that uh, this may occur by happenstance rather than design. Uh, what, 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 what might you offer in this regard? Well, luck, luck is important. Let's uh, never leave that out of the occasion. Good luck and bad luck, of course. Uh, I had extraordinarily good luck uh, with my ambassadorial assignments in Iraq and in Afghanistan because of the uh, uniformed commanders I was working with. Uh, with uh, Iraq, uh, Dave Petraeus and I got the warning order at about the same time uh, fall of 2006, which was absolutely the worst of times um, uh, in Afghanistan. We, uh, we had worked together to a degree in the early going uh, when he was up in Mosul with the division and I was uh, running, trying to run governance issues out of Baghdad. Um, and in our first uh, secure conversation, he was um, in, in Kansas, uh, Command and Staff College. I was still ambassador to Pakistan. Uh, we, we agreed that if we worked in lockstep together, there was no assurance of uh, success. If we did not, there was an assurance of failure. Uh, and it's, it's amazing how that can concentrate the mind. Uh, it took uh, signaling. Um, you know, for example, in my case, we had a crisis in Pakistan, crisis in Iraq, and I, I went from Islamabad to uh, Baghdad directly. Uh, uh, relinquishing authority in Pakistan in the afternoon, assuming it in Iraq in the evening. Uh, well, what that meant is I did not have a Washington swearing in. Uh, so we invited absolutely everybody, military and civilian, as many as could fit into the Republican palace uh, for that swearing in. And, and Dave Petraeus was on stage, part of the, uh, 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 part of the uh, uh, event. And that was, as it turned out, a pretty powerful signal, again, uh, to civilians and to military that uh, this really is one. Uh, another early step that uh, predated actually either of our arrivals was forming a joint strategic assessment team um, to look at our predecessors campaign plan, which they had acknowledged had failed, and how that might inform our efforts to produce a campaign plan that could actually work. Uh, but it also had a very important secondary mission, uh, which was uh, demonstrating to everybody out there that the two new guys uh, were determined that this would be a whole of government effort. So that meant for the JSAC, the, uh, there were co-chairs, um, uh, HR McMaster uh, <coughs> uh, for, for Dave and uh, Ambassador David Pierce uh, for me. And that was paralleled all the way down the line. Uh, so practicing uh, or trying to walk the talk, uh, was, it, and this was clear to us right from the beginning, and we 
uh, we were not idealistic about this. I mean, we knew there were going to be challenges. But we wanted to set tone at the top that this was going to be um, uh, a team effort. And finally, I would just say that uh, uh, <clears throat> that on Iraq, Ron's very important point on engaging the president, we did not always agree. Um, but what we did uh, was hammer it out between us um, so that in our virtually weekly NSC meetings chaired by the president, um, uh, we were not appealing to him separately to go my way and not, uh, not his way, for example, because I think that is absolutely crucial. If you get to the point where you got to toss it to the president, you are in very deep trouble. And again, lucky in having um, a great national security team uh, with uh, <coughs> uh, Condi Rice and, and Bob Gates. Uh, you, you could not have asked for better, better uh, secretaries of state and defense in those circumstances. Uh, uh, so yeah, we worked hard at making it happen. Uh, uh, but again, I, I was also very fortunate in terms of timing, uh, not least because these were my two years in Baghdad, last two years of President Bush's term, uh, he was all in. He, he knew that his legacy uh, would depend to a great extent on what happened in, uh, in Iraq in those last two years. And I would just say quickly on Afghanistan, a uh, very different dynamic, but some of the same players. My, my, my uh, having benefited from being sworn in at post in Iraq, I engineered the same thing uh, uh, in Afghanistan with John Allen present and the same message. Uh, I, you know, John and I knew each other. He was uh, the one-star uh, deputy division commander in MNF West out in Onbar when I was ambassador. I, he had worked the um, Sons of the Rock issue, the <coughs> uh, the Onbar Rising, uh, and I, uh, I would call him up the uh, VFR direct. Uh, Dave uh, Petraeus was totally fine with that. Uh, as I was sometimes when he would reach out to, to people under me, it wasn't about church. We all knew that. We all got it. Um, so again, I attach less to my own brilliance, <clears throat> more to the particular mixture of circumstances and players. Um, and the last thing I would say, really, this is the last thing, uh, in structures also count, obviously, having dug loot in Iraq. Uh, as Deputy National Security Advisor for Iraq and Afghanistan uh, was a godsend. Uh, he and I would speak virtually every morning via Tanberg. Uh, he would then uh, brief uh, <coughs> Steve Hadley, the National Security Advisor, and then they would both go see oh. President Bush. Uh, so having his engagement and of course the president behind him, uh, always ready to call a recalcitrant agency, uh, uh, about normally about people, I needed more. Uh, but again, it was a, a blend of unique circumstances. Sadly, it left no institutional legacy that I can determine. Uh, we, we are still where we were. Uh, uh, this is a personality dependent uh, situation. Um, turning, uh, slightly shifting focus, um, to whole of government activities in the field at the regional commands and the provincial reconstruction, reconstruction teams, my sense is that the department struggled to get enough foreign service officers to those locations, often relying on 3161 personnel. And, and I confess that that was certainly the case uh, for public diplomacy in Afghanistan. We couldn't push enough career people uh, to the field. So do you have any, any of you have reflections on the implementation of whole of government out beyond the embassy? And perhaps Ambassador uh, Newman first. Sure, well, you know, the most basic problem there is that the State Department does not own enough people. It never has. It's a fully deployed organization. It has no garrison, it doesn't have an Military has a so-called float about 15% over the number of people that fill all their organizational positions in order to handle training, transfers. It has nothing like that. Uh, and so 2008, when I left uh, Afghanistan, or 2007, I left the 
2008 when I did a study of this, uh, we had about 10% vacancies in every embassy in the world simply trying to staff up Afghanistan and Iraq. And got later. So this refer to this 31, 61 viewers, that's Colonel Washington provision of law of hiring of temporary people. Uh, some of them were excellent. Yes. Some of them uh, should never have gone out. Some of them had to be replaced in Smith. That process has never had an adequate staffing or look at what worked and what didn't work why. Because this is a very old problem. Um, the first time that I can find out that the military asked the State Department to come and help with civil governance was 1848. Uh, when they were trying to administer parts of Mexico that they had just captured. And the State Department couldn't make it then. They couldn't find the people. Uh, so the probability is that at some point we will have this need again, and we have not fixed it since then. And I'm told the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan is taking a look at this issue. They may have some thoughts where we, we really do need to have a mechanism I don't believe Congress is going to fund a permanent reserve corps. That idea has been around. It wasn't funded before for a variety of reasons. Um, but we do need a better mechanism to find temporary fills. There, there are other problems with the whole of government as well, which is agencies filling this. That's an issue we get into, but it's a separate one. Ambassador uh, Crocker, would you have anything to add on that? Uh, no, but I will uh, reemphasize Ron's excellent points. Uh, the State Department does not have enough of anything for the uh, missions it is asked to execute. We don't have enough people. We don't have enough money. Uh, generally speaking, we don't have enough support. And uh, uh, that is going to be a huge problem. On the PRTs in both Iraq and Afghanistan, it was seen by many in the military as a um, uh, a demonstration as to whether we were all in or not. Um, mm. And, uh, uh, you know, as Ron has said, uh, you had to get 3161s because there were not enough FSOs. Uh, but there was something else there, and I would like to think um, uh, is something that has changed in the intervening years. I, uh, I would uh, beat the bushes looking for volunteers or people who could be made into volunteers. Uh, to, to, to step forward um, uh, and got some very, very good ones. I mean, uh, I, I, Pat Butenis, who had been my extremely effective DPM in Islamabad, ambassador to Bangladesh, she called me up to say, well, when are you going to ask me to join you? She gave up her embassy to, uh, uh, in Bangladesh to come as DCM uh, in Baghdad, uh, Charlie and Marcy Reese. Uh, he was ambassador to Greece. He was ambassador to Albania. Uh, uh, they put their hands up, came to came to Baghdad as uh, responsible for economic and uh, <coughs> political military affairs, respectively. Uh, and uh, I think it's so obvious we may not remember to say it often enough. The uh, the cachet that the title ambassador has with the military is huge, absolutely huge. Yes. Uh, so if you got somebody. Uh, you got a team of folks out there, civilians, who all have that title. Uh, you get folks' attention. So it, it's, it's things like that you have to do because we don't have a process. Not then, not now, not next week. Uh, this is going to do this in a systemic way. And I, I have to tell you, one of the lingering, bitter memories I have of that period was uh, a, a town hall meeting the director general had called. Uh, precisely to talk up the importance of putting your hand up and, and getting out to where the war was. Uh, that degenerated into a, a fairly appalling spectacle, uh, including one FSO saying that uh, uh, that would be a death sentence uh, and he didn't join the Foreign Service to be executed. Well, I can tell you the pinging around that did in uh, military circles was, was hugely harmful. Um, and I, again, I, maybe we are in a much better place as a service now. I certainly hope so. I would note that despite that horribly painful incident and, and you know, my, 
my first reaction was we don't need a death sentence in a rock just shooting now but um, the uh, in fact we never had to order anybody to Iraq or Afghanistan we always had enough volunteers service but I do think there was a problem that over the 20 years we were engaged in these exercise, we simply wore out a fair number of people who had the right qualifications because it's one thing to have people volunteer. And we had a lot of volunteers, really exceptional. But we also had people volunteer who needed the money or whose marriages were breaking up, things like that, who probably weren't the right people. And uh, that's a problem. But that's a problem with short service. If when you do things like this for 20 years, yeah. you hear people out. Well, turning uh, to public diplomacy and strategic communication, uh, my own take, speaking of 2009 and 2010, is that public diplomacy executed the repertoire of traditional exchanges pretty well and did establish the network of Lincoln Learning Centers, expanded English teaching, uh, helping establish the Government Media Information Center, GMIC, uh, had good effects in moving the Afghan government to deal with the media. And the information unit expertly executed the embassy's media relations program. And our cultural heritage and uh, preservation expert, Lori Tedesco, uh, is now hailed as the war in Afghanistan's monuments woman. Uh, there were new initiatives like the Paywa social media program. But on the other hand, I, I always had the feeling that uh, the embassy's public diplomacy, strategic communications work didn't really mesh with military public affairs and PSYOP, uh, both in my time led by one uh, flag officer. And in my time, at least, neither the Uber for public diplomacy and strategic communications nor the PAO were included in what was in Afghanistan at that time called the Ambassador's Shura the most inner circle of decision-making. Uh, now, Ambassador Newman, you've often spoken of American failure to understand Afghan culture and the communications challenges in a counterinsurgency environment. I wonder what you might have to share with us today. Of course, my period was a little earlier than yours, Don. Yes. Um, I, you know, when you're trying to communicate in a war, We've got some unique problems. Uh, they're not unknown. In fact, there was a book by uh, I think 1969 on counter revolutionary warfare where he uh, talks about the difference. With the, he was a little frank, he called it propaganda between the insurgent and the counter insurgent. He said the insurgent can work with promises because they don't have power. The counter insurgent does has power and therefore needs to speak very clearly about what you're going to do in the immediate future. Then you have to do it. Then you have to go back and talk about the fact that you've done it. In other words, you have to keep reinforcing your message so credibility. You can't deal in broad generalization. And I think that has been a very difficult message for us as a group to get through. And it's particularly difficult at the military level, partly because of a, a rather heavy clearance process. Um, if, if they've got a longer chain of command than we do, not so much that people aren't good. Uh, they have a lot more money. But I, I don't think we will understood the process. And then another thing is, if you want to communicate in a foreign culture, you need people who spend long enough to really Understand the culture. And we had a short tour problem of, you know, we're turning people over. So even if you got somebody really good, by the time they really had their arms around what that culture, um, it tended to be moving on. One of the things I found, we had a focus group at one point. We discovered completely different Afghan. Uh, views of what an ideal public message is. Americans live in a media-saturated culture. So if you look at our public messaging, it's all full of bells and whistles and things to get your attention. 
what we found is that Afghans found that incredibly distracting. They wanted a more simpler message. And so somebody coming out of expertise with our public communications actually did it all wrong. Uh, and, and that's just the kind of stuff you take our time to develop. Ambassador Crocker, do you, do you have any insights to add from your time in Kabul? Uh, again, it, it uh, has a lot to do with personalities. Uh, Don, you mentioned at the outset there that um, uh, that uh, uh, PD officers uh, did pretty well on uh, traditional uh, issues. Uh, but the situations in, again, Iraq and Afghanistan weren't traditional. Uh, uh, and, you know, some, some out of the box thinking I, I found to be quite necessary. Take, um, uh, take Pakistan, the, um, <clears throat> uh, the Kashmir earthquake of uh, October 2005 that killed about 80,000 Pakistanis overnight and led to um, a huge US led um, relief effort. And here again, uh, personalities can come when we realize the magnitude a couple of days. Uh, my first call uh, asking for additional resources didn't go to the State Department. Um, uh, it didn't go to Washington. Uh, it went to uh, John Abizaid, then Commander Central Command. And I said, I need uh, all the CH-47s you can fly over here, and I need them in like six hours. Um, and he, he had eight on the ground within 24 hours. Uh, and it built up. Uh, uh, both civilian and military, we deployed two field hospitals, one Navy Marine, one Army. Uh, and indeed, the uh, Army field hospital up in Kashmir was the last MASH in operation uh, before we went to the new concept of uh, combat support hospitals. Uh, the problem in terms of public diplomacy is that uh, the uh, military provides overwhelming number of people, about 1,100 at the peak, um, uh, didn't really have a organizational role in telling the story. Um, and, and that was uh, another, uh, I had a, uh, a wonderful uh, Navy rear admiral um, um, who uh, John W. Zade sent out to, to run the show. I went to him and said, we got to tell a better story. Uh, he went back and delivered to us, and Peter would remember this, uh, uh, Ken Braithwaite a uh, reserve 06 in the Navy who did a spectacular job. Uh, you know, not a blowing smoke, but telling truths and, uh, and making things we were doing visible, embedding particularly Pakistani journalists in, in uh, some of our relief missions so they could see it up close and personal. Uh, uh, he was absolutely great. In Afghanistan, again, um, more, more luck than, uh, engineering, I had Eileen O'Connor uh, as the head of the PD section. I'm sure most of you know her and her various incarnations, a uh, uh, career journalist, uh, an absolute fountain of energy. Um, it it kind of started out with ISAF that um, the guys over there would sort of show the little lady the ropes. Uh, well, you know, a year, a year later, they would not clear anything or broadcast anything that she hadn't cleared on. Because uh, she just had it all. I mean, one of her initiatives was uh, bringing Sesame Street to Afghanistan. Uh, uh, she she negotiated that uh, directly with Sesame Street. We got uh, both uh, Dari and Pashtun versions uh, tuned up the content a bit uh, to reflect what uh, Afghans would appreciate, uh, and it was a roaring success with very little uh, money put into it. So. Uh, you know, those experiences taught me or reminded me that, um, you know, we are not the uh, sole repository of expertise in, in uh, public diplomacy um, in the international sphere. Uh, you mentioned, I mean, the whole theme here is whole of government. Well, uh, that would be a pretty good example. Um, and, and in Eileen's case, I mean, the whole of non-government. Uh, just get the best talent you can find and, uh, and deploy uh, my uh, China hand colleague, Charles Silver, was the PAO in Indonesia during the, the big uh, earthquake and tidal wave. And of course, uh, 
Marine, the Marines came in in a big way. But uh, he, 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 he'll happily share the lessons that he has, and they're largely the same, uh, that you've got to have public affairs coordination, collaboration uh, with the Armed Forces Public Affairs. Uh, is, but, but they need the embassy as well. Well, it's obvious from this uh, short conversation that the topic merits uh, in-depth research, studies, symposia, conferences. A good starting point for thinking about these issues in my book is the 1972 report by Ambassador Robert Comer on the work of civilian uh, uh, U.S. government agencies in Vietnam. You can find it on the web. It has a, uh, its title is Bureaucracy Does Its Thing. And uh, the bureaucracy of his time uh, had some similarities to the bureaucracy of our times, I, I discovered. Uh, I trust that the department will get around to this retrospective, not set it aside as it grapples with the new environment of uh, great power competition. Um, we, could, we could go on for quite a long time, but uh, I'm confident that our audience has uh, comments and questions. Um, let's see, uh, okay, so um, I see that Greta Morris uh, asks, um, in the absence of government to government relations between the US and Afghanistan, what can be the larger public com diplomacy community, including non-governmental organizations? do to foster people-to-people -people relations and promote education, human rights, and especially women's rights in Afghanistan. I guess that means from now in the new environment. Um, uh, Ambassador Newman, what, what, what might your thoughts be? Well, right now we have a particular problem that we walked out and left a whole lot of people behind us. Uh, and I think we're stepping up to that responsibility. There are a number of pieces of this. We have all people who work with us as interpreters, fought with us, left, I guess, about 15,000 of those behind us. Our, our process right now requires them to be fully documented. It's still about a year long process where they are ill where they're eligible for the visa. Uh, so, okay. There are a lot of things we could do, first of all, just to get the people who have a legal and moral commitment to out of Afghanistan. There is clearly a pressure with the, our government and others on the Taliban, uh, women's rights, and other things. And it's a very tough problem of how much we're going to use economic Strain. At the same time, Afghanistan is on the brink of a major humanitarian disaster. We have to rid this needle between keeping people alive and pressure. Uh, I'm going to see to Ambassador Crocker here. Who also has views on this. Yes. Well, um, yeah. A lot of. Uh, a lot of pain and painful lessons there right now that I think a number of us are trying to deal with. Uh, that um, you know we weren't forced out, we weren't defeated. We we decided we would walk out, and two successive presidents were um, enamored of that policy. Let's let's end the war uh, by not being in it anymore. Uh, well, that doesn't end wars, uh, and in the process of that withdrawal, I mean, we saw the horrific scenes out of uh, Kabul airport. Uh, yes, indeed, we left hundreds and thousands behind. Um, uh, uh, we also, in my view, um, uh, you know, really betrayed about half the population. I mean, we had uh, taken the position, really, right from the beginning of uh, our presence in Afghanistan post 9 11, rightly, I think, uh, that uh, if you're going to have a long term stable and secure Afghanistan to the degree that it will not ever again be used as a launch pad to attack the United States, uh, you need to do something about half the population, uh, like the female half. Uh, and uh, again, much criticism of nation building and losing our focus, I don't think that happened. Uh, 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 we, you know, when I got there and at the end of 01, 
I, I certainly knew what the focus was. Uh, uh, the security of the homeland, when I came back as ambassador, you know, 2011, 2012, same thing. I don't think we ever did lose that focus. We did have substantial disagreements on means, but not the goal. Uh, and for me, it was not a human rights issue uh, fundamentally, it was a national security issue to, uh, to bring women into uh, government. And the implicit uh, understanding was you step forward and we've got your backs um, until we didn't. Uh, so uh, again, I uh, find myself uh, still pretty uh, pretty bitter about the way this happened, uh, obviously, and the way it, um, I think, produced both America's security and um, America's uh, <coughs> values. Um, and to me, it's uh, hallucinatory, some of the conversations I've seen that said, well, uh, we, um, we have to hold the Taliban accountable for their treatment of females. I, you know, what kind of hallucination is that? We had agency in Afghanistan that, uh, among other things, uh, kept, kept women uh, in the mix. Not without threats, not without some losses, sadly. Um, and we gave up that agent. You know, everywhere else in the world where we might be concerned about uh, the treatment of, of uh, females, well, we don't have that kind of agency. We did in Afghanistan, we gave it up. And now we are pretentious enough to say the, the uh, Taliban must be held accountable. Uh, well, I think we should be held accountable. Um, and I, uh, again, I would, I would uh, simply say how uh, frankly discouraged I am as an American citizen that um, you didn't see a whole lot of voices, uh, major voices. Uh, from the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, standing up to say, wait a minute, uh, if we do this whole withdrawal thing under current cir circumstances or anything close, uh, among other things, women and girls are going to take a huge hit. Uh, and I can only conclude, and I have to be as controversial as I can here, uh, that for that wing, the dislike of the American military was, was stronger than the need to protect Afghan women. Uh, and I find that profoundly depressing. Oh, uh, wow. Um, Let me just throw one thing in here. Yes. I, I'm just gonna make it more complicated. <laughs> when we were there, we could put very strong demands for absolute action. Now that we're out, our leverage is very low. Just as Ambassador Crocker said, we have a little bit of leverage. We also have a terribly recalcitrant Taliban. Whatever is possible is, and I don't know how much is going to be possible, but what is possible is going to be in small deals. It's going to be getting a little bit of reform for getting a little bit of some kind of payoff. Because that's really the only leverage we're going to have. And any of those deals, are going to be profoundly inadequate. They'll be step by step. And there will be a strong tendency for people to criticize because this isn't adequate. Well, I'm sorry. The time when you could have done things big, we blew off. So now we're going to have to have some support for, you know, kind of dirty deal making a little bit of progress for a little bit of payoff in various forms and over time and it'll be slow but one of the worst things will be that we'll be incapable of that because we'll have people criticizing that we're not getting the total level of progress that we needed those will of course be the same people largely who wanted us out of the world uh, let me just add two things there because this is so uh, so important and so charged um, uh, again, in terms of uh, doing all we can, yes. I mean, uh, uh, accepting that we're out, we're not coming back. Our, our leverage is limited, but it's not zero. So let's find that uh, uh, leverage wherever it is, but let's keep our uh, uh, aspirations uh, in check. Among many other things, of course, the, the Taliban is facing a major threat from uh, one they probably consider an existential threat. Uh, 
even if they were inclined uh, to show a more um, humane face to the world, uh, their political calculations are almost certainly going to be colored by a view that, boy, if we start doing stuff that um, uh, Islamic State can represent as selling out the one true faith, uh, we don't go there. We may be in a fight for our lives here. So I think, I think it is even harder uh, than, than we might have thought at the outset. And to add uh, an optimistic note, at least optimistic for me, uh, after trying everything else, uh, the Biden administration seems to have turned competence uh, in, in managing the aftermath of <coughs> uh, our precipitate withdrawal uh, by asking uh, Beth Jones uh, to take on overall leadership of uh, uh, the, the major element of uh, our, our crisis with Afghanistan, getting people who need to get out, out of Afghanistan, managing the third country and military installation process where they will go initially uh, and finally overseeing the, uh, the, the US side of this, uh, their resettlement. Uh, you, know, you, don't, you don't get any better than Beth Jones uh, running these things. She stepped up to it for as long as it's gonna take. Uh, but going back to our early conversation on State Department resources or lack thereof, uh, you know, uh, Beth Jones is doing this as a retiree. Uh, because we don't have enough people with enough skills uh, to, to source it completely out of our own uh, active duty ranks. Having said that, I, I totally agree. Um, uh, Beth Jones, a colleague of Global World, um, but I would observe that she is badly handicapped by the lack of some overarching policy decisions that have to come out of the White House. Uh, the White House is not making those decisions. It is trying, as far as I can see, to limit the number of people who come out and to get Afghanistan in the rearview mirror as fast as it can. Uh, and so I, I totally agree that I think our colleagues in the State Department actually do a pretty good job. But they are enormously handicapped by the absence of some very large policy decisions on who we're going to take and how fast we're going to take. It. Nothing like the second phase of the Vietnam after a lot of people died. Anyway, we're getting probably a little ways away from your, uh, your original. Well, but I should have this discussion. But something where, because all of us, uh, maybe you know, we're in, we're in, or associated with U.S. government, public diplomacy, strategic communication. Uh, perhaps we're shorting the role of. Uh, private sector exchanges, uh, local initiatives, and so on, and uh, the- uh, Tom, the U.S. government is shorting that possibility. Right oh. now, we've got, we've got Afghan scholars who are getting turned down for visas because the question is whether they're going to be immigrants, which is yes. what uh, blocks them from having non-immigrant well, visas. Uh, and you've got a lot of people out there who, in fact, would prefer not to be immigrants. They'd like to go back to Afghanistan. So, yes, there's a huge role for the private sector, but the private sector role for soaking up uh, Afghan scholars and voices oh. is being seriously limited by, frankly, crippled policy. Well, so, I, I, I just wanted to make the point that there are more uh organizations in motion than just uh well, in efforts in motion than the than what we may be thinking of is no, there's the organization that ryan's uh, on the board of no one left behind there's a scholars at risk that's making a huge effort and is incredibly frustrated there are enormous numbers of veterans and ngo organizations yes. trying to get yes. people in and every single one of them is beside themselves with anger and frustration at the problems they are encountering with the administration. Now, I, I, I understand that Ambassador Crocker has got to leave on the hour sharp. Uh, so let me just uh, pose, uh, I'll, I'll let uh, him have the first answer. Um, what, and this is a question posed by Dan Shrevney. Uh, what lessons of any should we draw from our experience in Afghanistan for future possible crisis uh, situations. We've touched on them, but uh, Ambassador Crocker, perhaps some last thoughts before you have to go. 
Well, that takes us back to uh, where we came in. Uh, hi, Dan. Uh, great, great question. And of course, uh, Dan was uh, running public diplomacy in Iraq uh, mm -hmm. uh, when I got there and did a absolutely fabulous job uh, based in no small part on his area experience. I mean, he, he knew the messages that would uh, resonate and those that wouldn't. So there is just simply no, nothing comparable to the right people on the ground with the right kind of background and the right skill sets. Uh, 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 he then went on to something even harder, which was uh, being a State Department representative to the Broadcasting Board of Governors uh, um, uh, when I was a governor there. So uh, look, what we need to do, I think, is uh, accept the fact that we're going to do this again somewhere. And the, uh, you know, an Afghanistan slash Iraq kind of conflict, messy, uh, as much political as it is military, where there are no uh, clear cut choices for victory. I, I do not use that word. I didn't use it in Iraq. I don't use it in Afghanistan. Uh, victory was something in World War II. Total war, total victory. Well, that's not where we are anymore. So if we go in, first to have a, a robust conversation about should we really do this and uh, what could be the third and fourth or 30th and 40th um, unintended consequences. But second, to, to, to re-attack on this whole issue of whole of government and to set up some mechanisms. Uh, Ron rightly said the notion of a reserve corps is probably not gonna see daylight uh, anytime soon. Take a look at what USAID does with the DART teams, disaster assistance uh, mm -hmm. uh, relief teams. Well, that's a reserve system. The, the cadre of uh, full-time mm -hmm. DART uh, officers is tiny, uh, but they have lines out that if you are gonna de be dealing with an earthquake, well, California Fire Departments know a whole lot about that kind of stuff, and they're on that. They're signed up in advance for, for these deployments. Uh, uh, we, we need to expand that, uh, and we need to move it into other areas uh, because it's going to happen again. Uh, and right now, uh, I don't think we're a whole lot better prepared than we were for Iraq and Afghanistan the first time around. Uh, anything to add, Ambassador Newman? Oh, endlessly. <laughs> uh, you know, what I'm seeing in the public discourse right now is that we're not doing lessons learned. We're doing a few lessons observed, and we're doing most of those badly, reducing things to bumper sticker slogans that are not lessons. Now, let me just give you one that's strictly in the military, uh, and that is the frequent criticism, correct, that we build armies in our own image. Well, fine. What image do you want to build them? Unless we are going to tackle that problem, we will simply build them again in our own image. You can't send 10,000 or whatever people out to train a foreign army and say, you guys just make it up. Um, you have to have a doctrine. Uh, you know, one of the things that crippled Afghanistan was that we built complex supply air systems that depended on contractors. And when we decided to leave, we decided to pull out 15,000 contractors. And we literally pulled the wheels off the wagon and then wondered why we were back. So if we just talk about, you know, you shouldn't build it in your own image or you should have a different focus, those are not lessons learned. Those are cheap observations of things where we're not willing to make the effort to find out what it is we're going to actually do about it. And I hope we'll take some of those on, some of the structural ones Ambassador Crocker talked about, some of the basic ones. If, if we're not going to personnel system, how are we going to have a better recruitment system? And then one of my lessons would be the senior command people on both state and military side have to stay in place. Um, you cannot have coherent policy when you change your command team. Uh, I'm, I'm aware that Ambassador Rocker has to leave uh, imminently, uh, so of course I want to uh, thank you for the time and uh, some pretty powerful insights actually and some, uh, some frank talk uh, that we need more of. Uh, so uh, uh, with, our, with our thanks and gratitude, uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can feel free to sign off. 
and we can continue a little bit longer. I, I have so managed thank you, to, sir. I have managed this so that I can indeed get the last word, at least uh, before I, I tune. Um, yeah, there, there, um, there's some good stuff out there to work with. Uh, the Washington Post, of course, has come out with their mm. Afghanistan papers. Uh, I admire their diligence in, in getting those uh, papers uh, out uh, by FOIA. It took them a couple of years. Uh, but they're not what they're represented as. They're trying to evoke, of course, the, uh, the Pentagon Papers. Uh, that's not what this is. Uh, but there is a trove of uh, important lessons there to be learned. Um, uh, it's just that this, this effort doesn't take us there. So I'm, I'm hoping some uh, highly talented PhD candidate would want to grab that uh, and, and uh, distill uh, what the real lessons learned are or should be. Uh, and how we can avoid the same mistakes the next time around. Uh, we have the same thing, of course, uh, uh, in uh, Iraq, hard lessons that uh, uh, OIG uh, published itself. Uh, but it was by inspectors for inspectors. Uh, it, we, we need to find a way to get this good stuff uh, studied and organized and presented in a way that it can get the attention of policy policymakers before we wind up doing the same thing again. So thanks much for the opportunity. and. Uh, uh, I, I look forward to your conclusions. Thank you. <clears throat> the uh, uh, perhaps perhaps we can go with uh, just a little bit longer. I understand Joel Fishman also uh, has some time limits. Um, uh, there, uh, Karen Walker asks about uh, the arrangements that were made in, that, in Iraq for coordinating USAID and DRL funding with PRT training. Uh, as far as uh, public, diplomacy is, public diplomacy is concerned, at least in my time, uh, I think that that effort needed more, needed more development. At least as far as I could see, a lot of the 3161s were headed out to um, that were headed out to, to the PRTs uh, without uh, without without enough um, introduction to full service public diplomacy. What the commanders wanted were you know, an on-site civilian public affairs officers to to take the burden of journalists off them. So some of the some of the 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 work that public diplomacy might have done to support DRL and support USAID, I think, was uh, shorted in those in those circumstances. Uh, Ambassador Brian Carlson uh, raises the question: uh, Is it time to? <laughs> this is provocative, I'm sure, on his part. Is it time that uh, America's foreign affairs and defense policy they'd become so intertwined? Uh, and so complex, so resource dependent, that should we have a single structure, a Department of International Security? Uh, I'll toss that one to you, Ambassador. <laughs> well, I suppose you can argue it either way, but if you want diplomacy, I don't think you can merge it into a much larger department with much larger resources. There's a certain sort of basic pull where the money is. and uh, so to think that you can merge them and then have greater policy control when you don't have the money, and I have never seen that work in U.S. government. It's a little like, you know, we continually appoint a czar or a senior controller at the White House level to various functions, drug control or whatever. Well, unless the czar controls everybody's money, it's just a voice asking people, to, would you please do something differently? Um, you know, if you want control, you have to have a unified budget. Uh, well, I suppose you could put it all together. Um, I can't ever see the Congress doing it. But frankly, it's not, you know, quite honestly, I think it's not the lesson the military has carried away from this 20 years of war. At the senior levels of the Pentagon, they've been incredibly outspoken about the need for better resourcing of diplomacy. And of course, you have the frequently quoted comment of General Mattis, Secretary of Defense. 
of fun to diplomats, you're going to have fun more ammunition for me. Um, what I think uh, we have to work on is Congress. And Congress has actually been pretty good. You know, they've resisted the efforts of the Trump administration, on a bipartisan, resisted on a bipartisan basis. Um, but now we need some serious thinking about what it is we need to organize, how we need to do it. And some of that's going on, but I'm, I'm sorry to say that after hearing some very good statements from the Biden administration, Lincoln, when they came in, and quite recently, Lincoln's given a eulogy, um, I have yet to see a lot of action to go with the pronouncements. And I hope we'll see it. They've got three more years. But, um, I haven't seen much yet. I see that Peter Kovach has come up, come up on the screen. Uh, Peter, over to you. Uh, well, actually, uh, Joel was going to close us out, but I really want to thank uh, uh, Ambassador there, there and, and, and you, Don, um, for, for just a, a great and insightful uh, beginning of thinking on this and hope that somehow we can maybe merge our thoughts with the the 90 day process going on at state in some way, shape or form. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you uh, certainly to uh, Marcy and, and Carla for, for your tech support. Uh, Joel. Yeah, thank you. Take it away, Peter. take it away. Uh, ambassadors uh, Newman, Crocker, Don, thank you. You'll give us a lot to think about, and we will. Peter, my friend, you're on the hook. <laughs> we <clears throat> will start the new year on January 3rd with John Dixon, author of History Shock, When History Collides with Foreign Relations. Uh, Dixon, a former FSO, offers valuable insights into the daily life of a foreign service officer and the work of representing the United States. He organizes History Shock around a country by country series of lively personal experience vignettes followed by compelling historical analysis. That's the first Monday of the year, January 3rd. And on February 7, Alan Goodman, CEO of the International Institute for Education will discuss IIE's new research on international students studying in the US IIE, as we know, is one of the US's major international exchange organizations. And finally, uh, we're a little late for Hanukkah, but uh, on behalf of PDAA, PDC, and USC, uh, allow me to wish you all a Merry Christmas, a Bari Ghani, and a Happy New Year. May Christmas, Kwanzaa, and the New Year bring be meaningful and joyful for all of us. Thank you and see you next time.